So the Dig Digital project, this has been um, ongoing now for at least a couple of years and was actually originally conceived a long time ago at, um, as part of the Archaeological Archives Forum meetings when we were discussing, I think it was about eight years ago, the burgeoning um, issues with digital archives and digital data that was starting to be used on a day-to-day -day basis in archaeological projects, but not quite making it all the way through to an accessible archive. Um, the project itself is funded by Historic England um, and is being delivered by Dig Ventures. I'm managing the project and we're uh, running the project in partnership with the uh, team at CIFA as well. Um, in terms of this presentation, um, the session is going to talk about what FAIR principles are. Now, the Dig Digital project um, really has lent a lot on FAIR principles and it's a good um, it's a good way into why we're looking at digital data in this way. I'm then going to talk a bit about the digital project and the resources that we've been putting together and also some of the tools that are currently available and the ones that will be coming online in the future as we move through the project delivery. So without further ado, um, something that we're all familiar with uh, is why archaeological archives are important, but I think it's always worth reminding ourselves when we have these discussions about what we're actually trying to achieve. Um, the importance of archives um, and ascribing a value to them at the beginning of a project, for example, is really vital so that we're fully aware as we go through a project that the archive that we're collecting, both in the analogue material world, the finds and the plans and the documents, as well as the digital data, have a real value ascribed to them so that we look after them and we care for them. Um, they're essential to be um, retained as part of the ongoing legacy of projects and the reanalysis that we might want to do. So that kind of continuing contribution to knowledge and understanding. And also we've got a kind of an ethical prompt through our CIFA <laughs> standards and code of conduct to make sure that the material that we recover through archaeology is always made accessible. Um, so there's a real legacy issue that we need to be I think probably reminded of occasionally as to why we're doing this. That's captured very well in the CIFA standard, which has remained itself the same for a very long time. So the point of an archaeological archive uh, or an archaeological project rather, is that we create what is a stable, ordered and accessible archive. Now that standard itself hasn't changed and this project has not changed the standard. What we've been doing is trying to see what that standard means in terms of digital data and how we can improve guidance and signpost um, tools and resources to help people meet the standard as part of normal project delivery. And this is maybe what we think of when we think of a traditional archive, um, a load of boxes on a load of shelves, this, these ones being in the, the store in the salt mine, so this is part of the Cambridge collections, um, and we're, we're all kind of fully aware of boxes and box sizes and all the things that are in boxes. We also know that if we needed to look at an archive, we should be able to find the information that's um, kept within it. So if we're looking for a particular finds group or we're looking for a particular data set that should be in those boxes, we know that there'll be a register, we know that there'll probably be specialist reports that are linked to the finds materials, We'll know that the museum catalogues and indexes will be able to point us in the right direction and we can probably use tools like Oasis and um, ADS to try and find some more information that accompanies those in terms of the grey literature reports, for example. Um, so when we're kind of faced with this, this wall of boxes, we know that there's a way into it. And what we need to start thinking about is how that translates for all the other data that we use. So. Today, digital archives is often something that when you see um, talks about it or people um, having workshops about it, there's always a kind of what the future holds for us. And unfortunately, the future is pretty much now and it has been for quite a long time. We've been using digital in archaeology for, I don't know, 20 years. We've been collecting digital archives as part of the main um, group of photos for not quite that long, but for a considerable amount of time. And um, all of those different materials are now getting more and more embedded within the process. So today you can kind of carry your archaeological site around with you using a USB stick or you can access your data from the cloud 
And what you don't need to do is worry about where it's going to be, because you know that within projects and within organisations, that data will be brought together. Um, what we're not doing quite so well is making that accessible as part of that legacy archive. So whilst we think we can probably find those objects and those artefacts from within the boxes, the material that's the kind of digital accompaniment or the digital component of your archive is less accessible if it isn't deposited and it isn't created, collected and managed uh, in a kind of a good practice way. So the archives themselves need to reflect or the repositories for those archives today need to reflect the projects that we're doing. So on one hand, we're still keeping material, we're still using boxes, we're still depositing with traditional museum stores and repositories, but on the other, we need to do exactly the same with our digital data, make it just as findable, just as accessible, just as interoperable and just as reusable for different projects today. And when we think about some of the issues, um, the Algeo report of 2019 really um, shone a light in this direction when they, they compared the number of projects that were undertaken in England to the number of digital archives that were deposited with the um, Archaeological Data Service ADS. And even though there's obviously problems with timeframes being different and project completion rates being slightly different to just a window of time, the fact that less than 1% of the field projects that were undertaken during the 2013 to 2018 period actually resulted in the deposition of an archive kind of points towards the fact that those digital archives are not accessible. And here's a picture of my cat looking very confused because I've surrounded him in different ways of uh, storing archives. But really, archaeologists are really good at adapting to changing tools and changing data and changing ways of doing our work. I mean, we love to bring in new ways to make our projects um, more widely disseminated, more interesting to do, to make the data um, really kind of bring in a very complete and a very um, interesting archive that relates to an excavation. But we also need to think about how we then make that data accessible. So what ends up being stored is actually a, a, a full reflection of the archive uh, of the site in full. So I mentioned fair guiding principles at the beginning of this talk, and this is where archaeology meets the rest of the world. <laughs> fair data principles were put together in 2016, and this was a consortium of both researchers, industry, sector specialists and um, funding agencies looking at what actually happens to data from research projects. So this isn't necessarily a heritage thing. A lot of a lot of the uh, fair guiding principles have been picked up by all sorts of different sectors. But there was a real recognition that the same um, issues and the same concerns were happening across all sorts of different environments. So the point of the fair principles was really to make sure that not only the results of a project were available through publication and through dissemination, through talks and conferences and events, but that also the data itself was accessible and was able to provide that conduit to knowledge discovery, but also to innovation and to continue um, to be able to contribute to knowledge generation. The interesting thing or the very useful thing about the fair guiding principles is it not only thinks about human accessibility and people being able to access data, but is also very much aware of machines and how computers access data and can learn and help us do much bigger research through making data much more accessible um, to all sorts of different kind of operations and legacies. Um, and obviously there was also a kind of an, an ethical um, debate regarding the, from the funding agencies, particularly in terms of if, if research is publicly funded or research is funded by a body who wants to make that data accessible, then it needs to be accessible to everybody so that it can be used and can continue to be used into the future. Um, and I'm sure that most people will have heard of FAIR principles by now, but I think it's always worthwhile thinking about them from the sense of what those individual words, because we all have an acronym, so obviously it is one, but what do those individual words actually mean and what do they mean for us as archaeologists? So the four words, findable, accessible, interoperable and reusable. Um, 
are all things that we can break down and also consider from our perspective of what do we already have in the heritage sector that can fulfill or help us fulfill some of these um, pushes from these principles. So findability, the digital archive from the project is made publicly accessible through a public repository. It uses metadata uh, and it's assigned a unique and persistent identifier. So think of the findability as being something that you can refer to that be, means that you can find something and that you won't accidentally find something else. So it has to be unique and it has to be assigned in the same way as a publication might be. Now, there are things that are already in use and, in, uh, and have been for a while that, that kind of fulfill this role for us. So, for example, ADS, OASIS, the use of metadata tables. So if you did um, begin a project and look at the repositories available, you would be asked to use metadata tables in order to deposit the material. Um, that helps that findability. And the unique identifiers that we already assign to projects, the site codes, the HER event numbers, all these things make something much more findable because they provide the unique code. Um, your repository archive itself, so once it's deposited, will also be given a DOI, so that's a digital object identifier. So everything has this persistent identifier that means you can find it. It's also worth saying as well that um, archives across the UK are dealt with slightly differently. So um, Historic Environment Scotland, the Royal Commission in Wales and the Northern Ireland HER all retain digital archives for projects that are undertaken within those nations. And in England, the ADS and the ADS repository is the main area. And I'll talk a little bit about repositories a bit later. So accessibility, the digital material itself, which includes both the data and the metadata needs to be retrievable. It needs to be retrievable in a variety of formats, which are then usable by both people and by machines. Anyone with access to the internet should be able to access at least the metadata that's associated with that project, and also to be able to understand the conditions under which that data can be accessed. So that accessibility and the information around how something can be accessed also allows for some data sets to be um, more closed. So if, for example, there's any embargoes on data or there was any um, seem to be any risks for making data accessible, you can still deposit archives and deposit that data, but you just need to make clear how people can use that data and what steps people might need to take if they are able to. But otherwise, the metadata is available and that signposts people towards how that's then used. In order to meet the CIFA standards fully, which I shall go through in a little while, the digital repository itself must just also support public access. So this is something that's slightly added on to the, the, the basic FAIR principles in the sense that um, there's not many sectors where the data that you're recording and you're, and you're wanting to make accessible is linked to things that we've destroyed. So that kind of principle of um, a site archive making the site revisitable and reusable through record is still maintained through the standards of um, fair guiding principles. That accessibility has to be maintained through a public access archive. So it would be difficult to say that something is accessible, even if it's beautifully organized and very well looked after, if there's no way that anyone can um, easily access that data. And again, so some of the tools that we've got already in place are ADS library, uh, Oasis 5, but that would also include things like HER libraries and information that you can get. And also the permissions that we get as we go through the project and how they're recorded in the metadata itself. Open usable data formats is something that I think we're probably all aware of now. The use of proprietary software or, or um, files where if you don't have the software, you can't open them makes life very difficult when it comes to making a data archive accessible. So as far as possible, using a common, open, usable data format is the way to make your archive accessible. In terms of interoperability, digital data needs to be uploaded to a data repository, which can make the exchange and use of information possible. So that's talking about uh, data talking to data and, and platforms talking to each other to make the data within them accessible. So facilitating data aggregation and cross searching. Also that the metadata itself and as far as possible actually within the projects that standard vocabularies are used. Now this again it's not new 
to heritage, it's, it's not new to archaeology to think about typologies, classifications, monument terms, um, and thesauri, we use them and we, we use them when we're putting together oasis records, for example. So these things aren't going to be new to the majority of um, archaeologists. The, the difference about some of these things are the kind of requirement, for example, for a core trust seal. Now, when we talk about repositories, again, I'll talk a little more about this later. Um, in terms of understanding that the repository that you're depositing an archive with is going to look after your data in the way that um, will meet that C for standard. The quarter seal is the quality stamp that you would be looking for. Um, the good news about that is that if you look for that, then pretty much all the things to do with the fair guiding principles will be guaranteed through that quality stamp on the archive itself, because they will be asking you to provide all the information, the metadata, the use of the standard terms um, on deposition of the repository. So you don't have to worry about how that's then um, looked after. And finally, reusable, the R in FAIR. Data should be documented using metadata um, in a way that meets the standards and provides information about the provenance of the data, so about the site itself, the work that was undertaken. There should be a clear and transparent usage, usage license so that the repository itself knows how to manage that data and how it can manage reuse. And again, the data formats themselves should be widely, widely used, or widely used to be a slightly different way, but open at least and consistent with archive needs. Um, the data should be easily cited, easy to use, and easily integrated into future research. Um, and again, we've got some common tools that we're probably all familiar with in terms of how digita digital data can be managed and deposited in a way that makes it reusable. So common file formats, metadata standards, usage license attached to the archive and meeting the deposition standards of the repository um, will all help meet those. In summary, CIFA standards themselves will support fair principles. So the idea of that stable, ordered, accessible archive is very much in tune with the fair guiding principles, which is why I think it's really important to, to see how in undertaking our work and meeting the standards of our industry, we're actually doing the same as what everybody else is doing or what's expected within other research projects. Um, I'm going to go on to talk a little bit more about the project itself and how we can start to do that and also the tools available. But I wondered at this point if there were any questions at all about the fair guiding principles or if you just want me to keep marching on and droning. <laughs> Amanda, can I ask you a question? It's Russell Headland. Can you hear me? Yes, I can. Yeah, I'll just, just that statistic you threw up at the beginning there, that only 1% of projects have been archived, that's fairly that'd be shocking. What, what was the reason for that? Was it the cost or they didn't have the skills to present the data or what, what went wrong there then? I think in terms of that statistic, if you look um, at, if, if you kind of go and have a look in the ADS library, for example, at the archives that which have been deposited with projects, that percentage is really a reflection of where uh, projects have gone further than just attaching the final report to the record if that makes sense. So I think a lot of people are doing um, kind of good practice for digital data in the everyday management in terms of how data is managed within an organisation, because to be honest, it makes more sense and it makes our lives a bit easier. But it's at the close of the project when you deposit your boxes, um, it's it's that that one percent is just what's then been deposited with the um, with the ADS. So at the time and currently still, the ADS is the only Quarter seal repository that as a heritage sector we are, have got access to. I think probably a lot of projects and a lot of organisations are depositing digital data or have been depositing digital data certainly during that time period as part of the archive that gets deposited with a museum and also there would not have been a requirement at that stage for people to um, use things like data management plans which I'll be speaking about in a bit. The museums themselves would have been less um, aware of their ability to make digital data accessible as an archive. So to be fair, that statistic just reflects that there wasn't really the right um, infrastructure 
within projects, both during the setup stages, so perhaps the requirements within WSIs and understanding how data management plans can help support digital management throughout a project. Um, but also, uh, as you kind of progress through a project, once you get to deposition stage, for example, if a museum um, within their guidelines accepts the digital archive as part of the collection, then as of the organisation, you're fulfilling what you're being asked to do. So I think there's, we're playing catch up really in terms of what the requirements are and what the infrastructure is that actually supports the CIFA standard um, fully, if that makes sense. Okay, thank you. At the moment, as far as I'm aware, the, the Commission in Wales and also HES, neither have quite got to the point of getting the quarter seal, but both are definitely working on it. It's quite a big process. Um, and the standard itself is very much to do with accessibility and ordered collections. And I think if you're working in Wales or Scotland in Northern Ireland, you need to meet the requirements as well of the national bodies. Um, and in those cases, you would be working to deposit archives within those groups. They're certainly um, working within the spirit of quarter seal, but it takes a long time to achieve it. I'm, I'm catching up with all of those organisations actually over the next few weeks, just to see where things are at the moment. And one of the resources that will be included in the Dig Digital Plan will be a, a kind of a guidance note on what to do in different countries <laughs> as well, just to kind of make that clear and also keep everyone up to date with things as they're moving. And I think those are all the points, so I'll crack on now with the next. Um, yes, thank you, Andy, for confirming that. <laughs> um, so, so this is just the, it's the title slide, which is throwing me because I forgot it was in there, but in terms of the Dig Digital project, what we're trying to do, or what we've been trying to do, is create guidance materials that go alongside that, that standard itself, but also to translate the standard in terms of what that means in specifically to do with digital data and how you can kind of use some of the tools and resources to start to embed these principles in your day-to-day -day work. And as I said, I'm sure that um, a lot of you will be familiar with the things that I'll be talking about, and this won't be necessarily a surprise. Um, and hopefully some of the resources will be useful. Um, in kind of recognition of the fact that actually quite a lot of organisations are, are far along the path of um, creating good practice in digital archives management, we've tried to create a resource that can be accessed from multiple points. So it's not like a linear thing where you start, well, the document itself, which is I think something like a 40 page, very wordy document on, on digital archives. I don't know whether anyone's seen that is obviously a very kind of traditional way of presenting that guidance. Um, what we're trying to do within the, the online resource is, is make the information you need accessible straight away. So each of those sections represents a page on the website itself. And within each of those sections, there'll be additional tools and resources available. Um, you can uh, also see what we'll do is have a kind of a, a, a PDF or, or a kind of an e publication where you can quickly flick through um, each of those sections and see what it means in terms of um, where digital data might come in. For example, that this is the planning tab. Um, in terms of project planning, what you might do and on um, and the, the kind of iterative planning that goes on through projects as you reach different stages and how that might, how your digital data management might come into some of those different processes. So each one of these tabs that you see across the top will have a similar kind of uh, mind map, if you like, of those different areas. So you can flick through easily enough, hopefully, and find what you're interested in without having to start at page one and um, get frustrated by page 10 when you haven't found what you're looking for. Um, this is uh, the additional resources that are going to be available. So at the moment, the web page is up and I'm going to show you some of the uh, pages and, and how that is looking at the moment. But we're currently building a number of additional resources to help support the implementation of good practice for digital data management within your archives. So some of those will be case studies. So they'll kind of go into more detail about um, how digital data might be managed and uh, how the archive might be managed in different types of projects. Um, but also, as I mentioned before, digital archives across the UK, how it works in different nations, understanding fair principles and their relevance to digital data, and also some of the um, 
kind of the key moments, so selection strategies, what do you do in different types of projects? What do you do with digital data? How does it work with project monitoring? And what is the OASIS user journey? And this is very much in line with um, the work that is currently being undertaken um, by Alison James and uh, Ashlyn Nash, who are looking at the OASIS training workshop. So do look out for those as well. I think I saw somebody pop in, so we might hear a little bit more about OASIS later. Um, the toolbox itself, so these are, these are things that you can download and use. So the health check and action plan, I'm gonna show you a little bit of, as I am with the data management plan, um, but we're also gonna have a digital archive workflow example. So really break it down visually into the different stages of digital archive management. We're gonna have a workflow example and an editable template for metadata. So one of the things that we're trying to put together at Dig Ventures is a, a completely full, um, completely, uh, well uh, documented digital archive which will be deposited and made available as an example and then the editable templates will be templates that have been completed and will include really common information and also document some of the things that where we've kind of gone back and thought oh, what does that actually mean and how does that work uh, from a kind of everyday data management so hopefully in in undertaking the whole process and documenting it as we go through we found all the trip wires and we found all the things where you might think, I wish I'd known that at the beginning of the project and we'll be able to flag those up. And then there'll be like a full worked example that will then be accessible um, through ADS, just as a normal real project archive. We thought it'd be more useful to have a real world full example than it would to have just a kind of a made up one. And also because we'll be going through the process of deposition ourselves with it, we can also make sure that we do all the, um, all the kind of, going down the wrong path examples, making sure that those top tips are recorded so we can kind of make, make any mistakes that need to be made and tell people um, how to avoid them if possible. There'll also be an Oasis workflow example that will be included and the flashcards will just be kind of small visual tips and reminders of what the CIFA standards are, for example, how to use a data management plan, what a good file and folder structure might look like, um, some pointers towards selection strategy, the FAIR principles, deposition guidelines, and then security copies and backup. So hopefully amongst the digital data, uh, the Dig Digital website itself, plus these additional resources, um, it should provide some kind of useful and comprehensive um, add-ins to help people kind of pull down what they need or what the gaps are in their current uh, work processes, if they exist. I'm sure some people are doing all of this. Um, so this is what the website looks like itself. I can put the, um, the link to the website in the chat window in a bit, but you can see these different sections of the website itself reflect that kind of colorful mind map of the different sections. And each one of these headers corresponds to that. So the idea is that you can kind of, you can see what's in the archive in lots of different ways and then hopefully find out what you need to know quite quickly. In terms of the resource itself, it will also include the full guidance documents. So that's already available. That was created and um, made available, I think earlier this year. Um, that's the kind of the big one with uh, all the information about the background. It's got links through to things like the Mendoza report, which was the real um, stimulus for kind of creating this guidance set and moving it forward um, and it also has more ex explanation in there than the dig digital web pages do because a bit more room to in a document in terms of the tools itself one of the ones that i think and hope will be useful um, is this health check and action plan um, this to me or when i was thinking about how you might look at this from an organizational perspective it provides a quick way to run through something and just check what are you already doing that's absolutely brilliant and fine and, and really lends itself and what are the areas where you might want to um, spend a bit more time. The action plan there would just kind of focus your attention on what needs to be done, who needs to do it and when do you need to know by. Each of these areas are the ones that are reflected again in that kind of map of the different sections and then across each of the pages you have these orange lines are the things that we're working on. So by the end of the, by the end of March, I think all of these different resources will be available. At the moment, I've just put signposts towards them. If they're not there already, you'll be able to download the pages themselves, um, just in case you want a paper version that you can scribble on. Um, 
there's a kind of a quick what do the CIFA standards actually mean for everyday delivery? So there's a quick um, view on that. So again, all the kind of interpretation and explanation has already been thought about and done on your behalf, hopefully. And then there's additional information about data standards itself and quarter seal. Um, one of the key tools that we're including is a worked data management plan and this is what a data management plan looks like if you strung it all together, which is completely bewildering <laughs> and huge. But what we've tried to do in the resource is provide an editable version. Um, this data management plan is based on the digital preservation coalition example. Um, and what we've done is kind of reviewed it from an archaeological project perspective. We've also included in there, if I get down to a core part, the questions that you should consider to complete each of these sections. We've provided links to guidance and a little bit of explanation. And we've also included an example response. So we hope that there should be enough in there so people can see how a data management plan can be used and can be completed. And there's also a Word version, which is a blank version already, which I'm hoping people will use to then tailor to their own organisations. And once you have a data management plan that's Kind of, kind of completely full and completed for a kind of a, a normal archaeological project, shall we say, you will then need to tailor that to each project that's undertaken, but you won't need to reinvent the wheel every time. So it will become less of a big ask, if that makes sense, once that's already been completed. Um, the other aspect for digital archives to really think about when you get to the end of your project is that you do need to select from the archive itself. And that selection strategy, just like um, you would do for artifacts and other objects, um, you can you need to kind of review your research aims, your project aims and the significance of the results. And that will help you make those decisions about what needs to be included. So that could be anything from actually we didn't really find anything. It was a watching brief and there was, it was completely negative. So let's just make sure there's a record of that with the ADS record in OASIS with the report. But if you've got something that's a more significant excavation, for example, that's where you might include more data. Um, so the selection toolkit, I think everyone should be familiar with already. That's already available through the CIFA website. And um, that was a product of the Archaeological Archives Group. In terms of what you might select to actually put in a project, Again, this is part of that ongoing um, strategy of the project itself, and this would be recorded in your data management plan. And that data management plan, because it would be included at different stages, for example, your WSI, your um, assessment reports, your updated project designs, um, those would be the moments when you would start to really define how is that data going to be selected and what's going to end up. Um, what won't be in <laughs> the digital archive, unless it's a very unusual project, would be absolutely everything. So there's a there's a kind of a, a slight um, misinformation, shall we say, in some of the archive guidance that's already been published from a few years ago that suggests that all born digital data should be included in the archive. Of course, that's not the case because you would end up with all of your duplicate images. You would end up with multiple versions of reports that aren't really necessary to be included. And you would end up with information that is, is only going to baffle and not really help future research. So that process of selection, which you would normally go through for your uh, artifacts and for your um, paper documentation, for example, is exactly the same for digital data. What do you need in your archive to enable future research to re-examine the site? And how does that data need to be archived in order to facilitate that process? So the green bucket, it might include everything in the yellow one. It might only include a couple of things. And that's really dependent on the nature of the project itself. In terms of core trust seal and the trusted digital repositories, currently there is only one um, repository for, uh, that we can use as, as heritage organisations in the country. And that's the ADS in York. But as I said before, the Commission in Wales and HES and Heronia are all looking at different ways that they can uh, manage this at the moment. So there's a, there's a little bit of a catch up to do in, in terms of that availability um, currently. So what next? We're going to be doing a 
did digital survey. So a couple of years ago when we started the project, we did a survey asking everybody what they thought about digital data and archives. And we're going to run a very similar one so that we can just see where we are today. And we're going to run another one towards the close of the project. CFA will be launching the guidance uh, towards the end of this year, probably sooner rather than later. I hope now it's available. Um, and I'm also talking to the Archives Forum about when we're going to launch that um, under the banner of the Archaeological Archives Forum. And I'm hoping that Algea will be in a position to endorse the use of data management plans to its members. So we'll start to see that kind of that push to include that coming from the beginning of the project where we need it to be so that then it gets into the process, it gets into the costing and it gets into the resource planning. Um, from a registered organisation perspective, the expectation, I think, will be that data management plans will start to be used more often. Obviously, we can't kind of look retrospectively and say, so where are all your digital archives at? And one of the things that I'm hoping the digital health check and action plan can be used for really positively is to show the willingness of organisations to kind of recognise this needs to be done and this is how it's going to be embedded. So very much the way that um, we talk about our physical archives and the backlog, for example, of deposition, and just show that it's being managed and that we're trying our best, <laughs> we'll get there in the end, that the same would be um, in place for digital archives management as well. But I don't work for CIFA anymore, so I can't really say that. Um, in terms of what everyone can do today, um, you can download the current guidance and you can read it uh, or flick through it because it is quite long. Um, you could use the health check and the action plan. I'd love to hear any feedback about stuff that doesn't work before it, everything gets finalised. Um, if you have a look at the data management plan guidance and the checklist and also the word template and see if it is something that can be used and brought into the organisation and start to tailor the resources to suit the needs of your own digital archive management processes. And that, I think, is probably me.